Middle Podcast. The podcast dedicated to the music, movies, and culture of Generation X. What is up, Slackers? And welcome to another episode of the Stuck in the Middle podcast. I am your host, Jason Eck, and I am back with a normal recording interface this week. I had to go ahead and purchase a new one, which was not a expense I was planning on at the moment. However, it wasn't that big of a deal. I was able to get a, a, a nice bargain on it. So anyone who is either interested in podcasting or even recording music, basically anything you need to get to your computer somehow. So many people just use a simple um, audio interface. So that's what I use. And the company that I use is PreSonus, um, very reasonably priced, but works extremely well. Not as robust on the mixing side. I think in part of it is because how I record my podcast, which is through StreamYard. So I'm using just basic kind of proprietary audio recording when I do that. But the PreSonus allows for, and so I've upgraded a little bit. So it was a, a single mic system that I had before. Now I have a dual mic, um, which has its own, you know, controls and mixes, et cetera, and a nice simple monitoring system, which you can, of course, if you're recording music, put uh, external speakers up to be your monitor when you're recording. So anyway, Little simple unit around a hundred bucks gives you everything that you need to go straight into, you know, it's, it's a USB in. They do not currently have a USB C type yet. So I am using a uh, supplemental docking station to help with that. But I, I would just thought I would share a little bit of the, the technical pieces because one of the things when I was first getting started was trying to find, you know, equipment and, and how it works. Never done it before, right? I had done one podcast, I think I mentioned before, which was a, a wrestling podcast, and I was doing it with a simple, basically a lapel mic that was a direct USB mic. It wasn't working as well because I would have a single port, particularly on my, my old MacBook, so having the microphone meant that I really didn't have a great monitoring system, so I was able to find a way to go ahead, have the microphone and a pair of uh, headphones picking everything up, but it was substandard. It was very rudimentary. So I was just looking around and talking to different people. The uh, first version that I got, I believe I got through uh, Sweetwater. Uh, once you start purchasing from Sweetwater, you will have your own rep. And uh, so anyone who does, you know, get instruments, recording equipment, etc., I do recommend Sweetwater if for nothing else, the customer service experience. Uh, the last guitar that I purchased, however, I ended up buying internationally through what's probably... I would say like the Sweetwater equivalent in Europe. Um, oh gosh. Um, Toman. I was going to pronounce it wrong. It's called Thompson, but Toman. And uh, I bought a Harley Benton guitar, one of their Telecaster type guitars. So there's my little bit of equipment kind of discussion for this evening. Uh, I'm looking around uh, in my, my quote unquote studio room that I use. And anyone who's seen the video version, there is a acoustic bass that's sitting behind me. All of my bases need to be restrung and re, basically reset. I got to set them up from scratch, to be honest. Part of it was from the move, which was a couple of years ago now. Part of it was trying to find the right strings, particularly for an acoustic instrument. And then one of the bases that I bought is a, uh, a Chinese manufactured bass. And there's something odd about the, the gauge of the string. So finding an easy replacement, which I thought would be an easy replacement, not so much, so I have to bring it in to get done. So anyway, little equipment talk, and now let's move into the topic for this evening. So the best way to do that is to kind of give you a little bit of a a glimpse into my weekend. So, well, I guess I should, I should break it up into two parts. So anyone who's seen the Instagram feed uh, saw that I went out on uh, Monday morning of last week. So Monday the 12th. And I put up a short video, a short reel, talking about getting up on the treadmill for the first time in, gosh, probably a year. Maybe not quite a year, but it's been a long time. And the first step on a fitness journey. And I only got through that first post. So 
Tuesday was my birthday. I did not want to get up early to work out. So here, here's the thing. I've always been a night owl. Always been a night owl. And here I am. I just turned 49 years old. So the last year of my 50s. And can I really become a morning person at this stage of my life? Now, I don't believe anything is impossible. That whole concept of you can't treat, you know, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. I think that's horseshit. I think if you're, you're committed to anything or really want to do something, you probably can, regardless of where you are in your phase of life. Becoming a morning person really seems like a challenge since I've been a night person ever since I was a little kid, just always. So didn't want to get up Tuesday morning. Now, my plan was, my plan was that Moving forward, my days are going to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during the week. Part of it is because on Mondays and Fridays, my youngest son is doing strength and conditioning for fall football. This is at the crack of dawn. So 6 a.m., he needs to be there. So I could go ahead, bring him. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have home gym equipment, get a workout in. My wife will go pick him up when it's time. And I can shower and go to work. So that's going to be Mondays and Fridays, definitely. But then Wednesday was going to be my other day. So midweek, so your alternating days. So that way, when I get back to lifting, you're getting rest and recovery. Except Wednesday morning, I knew that I had a doctor's appointment, a 7.30 a.m. doctor's appointment. So I'm not going to work out Wednesday morning. I'm going to work out Thursday morning instead and do a back-to-back on Friday. So... I drive to my doctor's office, about a 20 minute drive, not too bad. And I arrive there only to find out that my appointment was not for Wednesday. Nay, it was for Thursday. So I headed off to work. Now that means I'm not going to work out Thursday morning because now I have to go to the actual doctor's appointment. So I have my doctor's appointment Thursday. So again, Friday, my son's going to go to strength and conditioning. So I'm going to get up. And I'm going to work out, except he has a two-day basketball tournament out of state in Connecticut at Mohegan Sun. He says, you know, I don't think it's the best idea for me to go to do strength and conditioning, be lifting, and, you know, they're doing a lot of squats, a lot of lower body stuff, and, and you know, bench, which is not something he's used to. Like my older son was working out with me for about a year before he even did strength and conditioning for football. So he was, he was used to the gym. So he's going in cold. He's like, you know, I'm going to be really sore and, you know, we got to drive. We got the, the back-to-back games. He's like, I just really don't think, you know, I should go to strength and conditioning. Now, this is all very reasonable. I'll be honest. And I shouldn't give my kids all the outs that I do. Maybe I should have said, you know what? Get your butt in there. You're going to go and you're going to do it, right? I don't know. Maybe subconsciously, I'm just like, oh, well. If, if he doesn't get up to go to strength and conditioning, you don't need to work out. So I didn't. But for the Mohegan Sun, um, so this is where I'm getting into the whole kind of week. Um, the hotel rooms, we didn't book like in advance because we really weren't sure what the time frame was going to be. If you didn't book that group rate months ago, a good grief. You couldn't get a reasonable hotel rate within 30 miles, right? Not too bad of a drive, right? But if I'm going to do a 30-mile drive, I might as well just drive the hour and a half and it's going to take to go from my home to Mohegan. So that's what we did, back-to-back days. You had a game um, on uh, 8 o'clock or 8.10 on Saturday morning. So we got up, we were on the road at 6, got there, boom, played his game. Had a three-hour in-between break before the next game. One o'clock, he has his game. Boom, we're done in 40 minutes on the road. Back home in time, have dinner with the family. And then Sunday is uh, Father's Day, right? Which is wonderful. And again, hop in the car. The game this time is in the afternoon. So we're going to go there. And when we get back, we'll go to, you know, uh, late afternoon mass. We'll get church in. And then I decided, and this is where... Hey, where are you going with all this? This is where we've arrived at the topic for this evening. So I said, guys, I know what I want to do. After Mass is done, I would like to go see The Flash. 
And we were talking about doing like a family dinner for Father's Day. So I get to choose. And I'd mentioned on the podcast, there's this place called Chunky's Cinema Pub. And there's a location in New Hampshire that's not too far away. And it was going to be about 25 minutes from Mass to the place. We get there a little bit early so we can get in on time. You get in there, the trailers start, you put in your meal order. I got a nice Kevin Bacon burger because all the all the meals are based upon something cinematic, a movie, an actor, a character. So I got the Kevin Bacon burger. Most of us got the Kevin Bacon burger. The only difference was the choices of cheese and sides, etc. So get my Kevin Bacon burger. Boom. Here's the movie. Now, just to get this piece out of the way, um, Ezra Miller, who is the star of The Flash, is clearly having severe mental health issues to such an extent that he has committed some heinous, heinous actions and crimes. Allegedly. I say allegedly. Some things have been on video camera. Were they staged? Were they real? I don't know. But obviously a severe mental health crisis. And honestly, I think Hollywood is just ripe with people with severe mental illness. Um, Ezra Miller and I probably would not agree on much in life, to be perfectly honest. But if I didn't go to see movies solely based upon either the the actions, the inactions, the words, the deeds, the the Everything from from politics to, I don't know, um, drug use, alcohol, um, just all kinds of things. Misogyny, racist, like all these bad things that happen in entertainment. I'd never see a movie again. Like I'd only watch Keanu Reeves movies. Because by and large, apparently he is just the best person and makes many of the movies that I really enjoy. So go ahead and check out the Keanu Reeves episode, the not quite Gen X icon. But I was really thoroughly enjoying the movie, which has gotten a lot of negative press. And I think much of that is wrapped up in the Ezra Miller piece. But what about the movie itself? Now, some would say that the CGI was subpar. Talked to the director and he's like, some of the visuals are really meant to be exaggerated and odd because of the Speed Force, which is the whole, you know, spoiler. Um, there are some spoilers, just so you know. So right now, I'm just letting you know there are spoilers here. And I will do my best to not get so specific. But it is a piece of the... It's a part of the topic, like some of the things that come up. So maybe I'll do it this way. Okay, so... Because I, I really am respectful of people who might want to see something. They don't go... Open weekend, obviously not a lot of people have gone opening weekend. The theater was not as full as I anticipated it to be, anticipated it to be for such a large opening of a superhero franchise. And a lot of stuff can go into it. There's the reboot or the relaunch of the Disney cinematic, Disney, DC cinematic universe. So they're really blowing up the DCEU, which is, I think, most commonly known as the Snyderverse at this point with uh, James Gunn taken over. So maybe there's that whole, well, this isn't even canon or is it canon? Like, what is it really? Plus the Ezra Miller stuff and you just get this bad marketing scene altogether. So I go in just really loving the character of the Flash and here's where I I won't give spoilers, but for anyone who knows anything about DC Comics, so long before there was all this Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, and Across the Spider-Verse, all those kind of things. DC Comics really, in my opinion, and I think this is factually based, kicked off the whole concept of the multiverse with a series called The Flash of Two Worlds, which is bringing what they call the Silver Age Flash, Jay Garrick, with the Bronze Age Flash, which or is it Golden Age and Silver Age? Golden Age Flash, Jay Garrick, and the Silver Age Flash, Barry Allen. The Bronze Age Flash is Wally West, who's I consider my my Flash. Anyway, but the uh, Flash of Two Worlds really set the the stage that there was an Earth One and an Earth Two, and then extended into Earth Three, where there uh, all the heroes are actually villains. So instead of Superman, it's Kal El, Ultraman. 
And basically, this culminated in 1986 with what was called Crisis of Infinite Earths. So this whole infinite universe of possibilities. So that's what they really kind of led into. So it's it's two stories. It's uh, the Flashpoint series of Flash. I know, this is nerd talk. Some of you are like, done with this episode. Please, try to hang in there and get through the the ep- uh, the prologue that I'm doing now before we jump into the fun stuff, right? So, anyway, what they did to give you the visuals of this multiverse was they gave little clips and scenes from across the history and even across the 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 pitched ideas that didn't quite make it, the movies that didn't exactly get made. And I'll leave it at that. And you got this kind of brief history of, you know, DC and film. And I love that because it really does have some, I guess, linear history to it. But now, you know, it's it's all reboot. We're, we're going to see where they go. I'll just say that we've got glimpses in this movie of, George Reeves, not to be confused with Christopher Reeve, although Christopher Reeve, um, Helen Slater, like these are all things that are just kind of buried in the background, right? It's not necessarily in the forefront. I don't really think I'm spoiling anything by telling you that there's glimpses of all these different franchises that have come up under the DC banner in film. But it really made me somewhat nostalgic because this part is not a spoiler because it's in every single advertisement. You, of course, have Michael Keaton returning to the role of Batman. Now, some people our age are going to be split of what they consider to be their definitive Batman, whether it's Adam West from the TV series or Michael Keaton. Now, I will say that that Michael Keaton, when he became Batman the first time, this was a decision that was maligned in the trade newspapers by fans Letters to the editor in in DC Comics. Like, this was a catastrophe. How could this guy, who's a comedic actor, going to be Batman? And now people consider him, at least many, the authoritative Batman. Now, for me, I'm going to be real. Christian Bale is the Batman. Just like Heath Ledger is the Joker. That's just how I look at it. These are my opinions. So it got to thinking about the episode I did a few weeks ago about did Gen X dumb down culture? And I got to thinking that there is definitely an intersection in the superhero movie trend and our generation and subsequently our younger brothers and sisters and our own kids who are anywhere from millennials into, you know, Zoomers and watching some of these superhero franchises, even animated series. And I was looking at just the history of the superhero film. And I thought that would be a fun topic because this is a little bit of a glimpse of not only the evolution of superhero movies per se, but also some key points in cinematic history as well. So why don't we dive in? Now, these are the things that you probably don't remember unless you're really into it. So Really, the first live-action DC property was Superman and the Mole Men, which was 1951, and that was with George Reeve, and that was considered Reeves. And that would be considered a kind of a pilot for the Adventures of Superman TV series, which, of course, started in black and white. And then 1966, you have Batman, which was Adam West, Burt Ward, and, you know, Burgess Meredith, Cesar Romero, Frank Gorshin. Um, oh, um, it wasn't Eartha Kitt in that one. It was, um, oh my goodness. Newmar, Newmar, Julie Newmar, Julie Newmar. Okay, got it. Um, but that's not where my memory of film starts, right? So early Xers, you're born in 65. You're one years old and the Batman movie came out. So for us, the first real one was 1978. And of course, I'm talking about the Christopher Reeve, Margot, Margot, 
Margot Kidder. I was about to call her Margot Robbie, and I had to stop myself before it came out of my damn mouth. Um, but Gene Hackman is Lex Luthor. Uh, Christopher Reeve, of course, is the, the Kal-El Superman Clark Kent. And this was considered groundbreaking in part because of the, the special effects were such a far cry from George Reeves where basically he was just like lying on a table or something, or maybe he was suspended and had one position the whole time, right, when he flew. But this had dynamics to it. This was wire work. I just think about that whole balcony scene and how smoothly he he comes down or when he rescues Lois. It's all so very cool. Now, were there some obvious shots where you know it's special effects, but it was so well done. And Christopher Reeve embodied both Superman and Clark Kent. And he acted as two separate people. And that was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So, of course, you have Superman 2. Now, this is uh, one of those stories that was easily replicatable. And anyone who saw Man of Steel, which we'll, we'll talk about after, um, you have General Zod and and uh, Ur-ra? I don't want to call her Ahura because Ahura is, of course, from Star Trek. Ursa, right? And Non, right? Non is as without thought as he is without voice. Oh, Terrence Stamp as Zod. So good, right? And the whole story of Superman just being Clark Kent. And I guess there's a Donner cut, which I haven't seen. Um, yeah, I don't know about the Donner cut. But that's uh, 2006, re-edited director's cut of Superman 2. I'll have to check it out. So then in 1980, 19- 82, right? So Superman comes out in 78. Superman 2 comes out in 80. But now in 1982, so DC has now, and this is something that that James Gunn has said uh, recently, is that they were selling off IP like candy, but not for the value, right? So they license out to Embassy Pictures, Swamp Thing, which of course was written and directed by Wes Craven. And I thought it was so fun. Adrian Barbeau, of course, I was still completely crushing on from Escape from New York and stuff like that, or vice versa. I forget which one, but loved Adrian Barbeau. But Swamp Thing was meant to be a a dark comedy, but it's also this weird romance. And, you know, you have, uh, oh, what is his name? Who's Anton Arcane? Oh, Luis Jordan. So good, just eating up scenery. But I thought it was really clever. So Swamp Thing, 1982, kind of a cult classic. Then we get the last of the Superman movies that I think most of us regard well, right? Not as well as one and two, but of course, Superman three with Richard Pryor as a computer geek. I mean, it is definitely campier. But, um, you know, Pryor's great, and Chris Reeve's great. The special effects are great. I mean, there's, it's not unlikable. Let's put it that way. It's just not as strong as the prior two entries, but I still think it's a lot of fun. Um, and now we have another spinoff, the first spinoff of the Superman movies. And so now we're here in 1984, and the Helen Slater-led Supergirl. Trivia note, Helen Slater, who is here as Supergirl, uh, Kara Danvers, is the mom, the adopted mom, to Kara Danvers in the Supergirl TV show. I love when they do that, these little kind of homages to, you know, hey, when this actor was 20-some-odd years old, they were the lead character, and now they are in middle age, they can play uh, a mom. I think it's great. But uh, Helen Slater, also best known for what? The Legend of Billy Jean? Is that what it's called? The Legend of Billy Jean? Yeah, The Legend of Billy Jean, Ruthless People, Secret of My Success, City Slickers. Oh my gosh. Um, 
she's done voice work as well for DC Comics uh, as Martha Kent, voice, of course, of uh, the mom of Superman, not the voice. She's the voice of Superman's mom, Martha Kent. Um, But not just... Oh, she played... Um, <laughs> She also played Lara L., who is Superman's mom on Smallville. Again, this neat little piece of, of stunt casting, if you will. But yeah, so, so good for her. Helen Slater. And then the... Oh boy, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace Against the Nuclear Man. Now, as someone who is a avid comic reader at the time, Nuclear Man, that was uh, Firestorm, who is a good guy and couldn't be more removed from this crazy piece of hot garbage. I think I've seen it just the one time in the movie theater because it's Superman and going, wow, that was atrocious. Really bad. You, of course, get 1989's Return of the Swamp uh, Swamp Thing. Um, not as um, memorable. But I will say that uh, director Jim Wynorski flunked out of film school and went to work at the fiction department of Doubleday Publishing from 1972 to 1977. And uh, <laughs> his... Filmography is very interesting. Um, Try to think if there's anything that jumps out of saying, hey, that was actually a good one. Well, he did Beastmaster 2, The Portal of Time. Oh, wow. These are some amazing titles. Um, Yikes. Uh, no, doesn't really look like um, anything of note. Uh, he has apparently gotten into some more adult fare at different points in his directing um, history. So, yeah, don't really remember that one. Moving on. Okay. So, also in 1989, you have Batman. The Michael Keaton, Tim Burton, Batman. In 1992, you get Batman Returns, also with Michael Keaton. So, of course, you know, the first Batman was uh, uh, Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Phenomenal. Kim Basinger as the love interest. Batman Returns, Michael Keaton. You have Danny DeVito as the Penguin. And you have Catwoman played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Tremendous. And I mentioned it a couple episodes ago. You also get Christopher Walken. Amazing. So then we take the hard turn. And that's where you get Batman Forever, which is now being directed instead of Tim Burton by Joel Schumacher. Who decidedly chose to take the little bit more campy approach to things, which is really unfortunate because the cast itself was excellent and there was a ton of upside and it wasn't bad, but you have Tom Lee Jones as Harvey Dent slash Two-Face. You have Jim Carrey as the Riddler. You now have um, Batman being played by Val Kilmer. And I've mentioned many times on the show, I'm a huge fan of Val Kilmer. Excellent. And they introduce Robin being played by Chris O'Donnell. Really strong cast. Like, honestly, um, you have um, Nicole Kidman as the love interest, but it just simply didn't have the same magic and that edge that you got from the Tim Burton movies. And and that's going to be, I think, incredibly important in, in just a minute. So then you get the last entry, okay, of the Batman movies from this time period in 1997 with Batman and Robin, this time with George Clooney and the the bat suit with nipples, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze, Chris O'Donnell's back as Robin, you have Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy, and Alicia Silverstone as Batgirl. Again, from a casting perspective, awesome. 
I mean, seriously, really, really strong, really strong. And they, they gave their all to these roles. And I, I and personally, I really quite enjoyed both Uma Thurman and Arnold Schwarzenegger in their roles. It was just too campy to the point of being just comedy. It was like watching. You were expecting the automatopoeia to come across the screen. The, the screen, bing, bang, wow, pow. Like honestly, it was Adam West, which is unfortunate because George Clooney looked the part of Batman, looked the part of Bruce Wayne. I thought from a casting perspective, excellent. From a scripting and directing perspective. But that is so telling, okay? Because also in 1997, you had Steel, starring, of course, Shaquille O'Neal, as John Henry Irons. So John Henry Irons um, was one of the, was it four? Yeah, I believe it was four Supermen who rose up after Superman was killed in the death of Superman series where Superman dies um, in his battle with, um, oh my gosh, seriously, I'm drawing a blank on one of the ultimate big bads in all of Superman's like history. Oh my gosh. Why is it not coming to me? Overkill, something kill, death, something, (laughs) Um, oh, it's like Armageddon, Doomsday. I see, I said Armageddon, Doomsday. All right, so he was one of uh, the Supermen who, uh, after Superman was killed by Doomsday, so you had the uh, Eradicator, you had uh, Superboy, you had uh, Cyborg Superman, and you had Steel. Whole bunch of stories on each and every one of those. I won't get into it at the time, but nevertheless, 1997, was the last time for a number of years before DC had another movie out. And the first one that they did wasn't a great choice, to be perfectly honest with you, but that's where we're going to jump over to Marvel. So with the exception of 1986's Howard the Duck, with Leah Thompson and... Just the the intimacy of Leah Thompson's character with Howard the Duck is um, something that you just want to burn your eyes out. Yes, but that was a a co-production with Lucasfilm because George Lucas is a weird cat. But 97 is the last, like I said, DC entry in film. But in 1998 was really the first Marvel franchise to get kicked off. And many people think it was X-Men, but in fact, it was Wesley Snipes led Blade was the first Marvel Cinematic movie. I personally rather enjoyed Blade. Wesley Snipes was great. Chris Christopherson, excellent. Something a little different. And I think, was that Stephen Dorff is the bad guy in that? Yeah, he was excellent. I, I think he's one of those actors who has just kind of fallen under the radar. You know, and I understand why some would say maybe he he's not leading man material, but he's still very, very good. So shout out to Stephen Dorff and the blade number one. So then you have the so there's the whole thing with um, Marvel's properties from an IP perspective, like I mentioned with, uh, you know, DC is that. You had 20th Century Fox holding the rights to X-Men, and you had uh, Sony Entertainment owning Spider-Man's, like, movie entries. They licensed it. So in 2000, you get the first X-Men movie, which introduced us, and this is what's a mind blower, right? It is 2023, 23 years later. And Hugh Jackman is once again reprising the role of Wolverine in the upcoming, I guess, currently filming Deadpool 3. Talk about becoming, I don't know, like um, franchises that last this long because the whole crew, with the exception of when they did First Class, but even with First Class, they had some overlap with those original X-Men. Halle Berry is Storm, 23 years later, like without a doubt. 
Hugh Jackman. Um, I mean, Famke Jansen, I think, could jump in as Jean Grey any moment now. And, uh, you know, James Marsden could be Cyclops anytime. It's just really interesting. But Patrick Stewart, you you have um, Sir Ian McKellen as Magneto. Uh, Rebecca Romaine was, uh, of course, um, Mystique, which were then played later on by uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Anyway, even the young, old actors where they end up bringing in, oh gosh, um, what's his name? Um, Pulling it up here so I don't forget. James McAvoy, right, as the young uh, Professor X. Michael Fassbender as the young Magneto. Just inspired casting. But nevertheless, they have Blade, Blade 2, right? X-Men, and then 2002, at the same time as Blade 2, you have Spider-Man, the first entry with Tobey Maguire, directed by Sam Raimi. Um, Also, uh, Willem Dafoe, just killing it as the Green Goblin. So, so good. Um, Was that the last movie for Cliff Robertson as Uncle Ben? Might have been. But then you have a dud in there. So again, licensing agreement. Daredevil with Ben Affleck. Now, obviously, Ben Affleck will come up again shortly, but it wasn't great. You know, uh, Colin Farrell was great in it, you know, um, as Bullseye. You had uh, what's her face as Electra. Just she had the look, but not the gravitas. Then X2 in 2003. And Hulk, which was also rebooted a number of times. And this is what the um, Eric Bana one. Yeah, this is Eric Bana, um, which was directed by legendary director Ang Lee. Who was, you know, really getting into his first, you know, Hollywood face at this point. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is a masterpiece. I haven't seen Life of Pi. I've been meaning to, to do so. So, here we are. Now, over at DC, their only entry heading into 2000. Oh, you know what's missing from this list? Holy cow. You know what? I got to I, I gotta get my access to uh, Wikipedia because I'm re- reading them in order. And then I notice that there's something glaringly out of place here. And that is the original... Punisher movie that came out after Howard the Duck and what year was that uh Punisher 1989 yeah it's not on the list so of course of course Dolph Lundgren Dolph Lundgren as uh Frank Castle which I thought was really great you also got Lugos Jr in this um yeah interesting that it's missing because that certainly needs to be on the list of movies. Now, the reason that that jumped out to me is because in 2004, you had The Punisher, which was with um, uh, Thomas Jane and John Travolta. I thought Thomas Jane was excellent. If you've ever seen the short film that someone made, which was meant to be like their own version of if you really did the character true to the character, what that would look like. It was great. Um, nevertheless, Thomas Jane, excellent Spider-Man two, and then Blade Trinity Trinity all came out in the same year. Now Blade Trinity was with, I believe Ryan Reynolds and, um, Jessica Biel. I really enjoyed that. Parker Posey, I think was the big bad in that along with Dominic Purcell over at DC in 2004, Halle Berry's Catwoman. Oh, it Yeah. Yeah. Weird choice, weird outfit. Like, I don't know what they were going for, but it was pretty rough. 2005, also rough over at Marvel was they had Elektra, which I don't know. They went all in with it with Jennifer Garner. I mean, okay, that's great, but also Fantastic Four, which was 
which is okay. This was like the uh, uh, Ian Gruffle, Jessica Alba, Chris Evans in his first Marvel role. That is cheating, my friend. Uh, and Michael Chiklis, who I thought was uh, a great, an absolutely great thing. And Julian McMahon, who I think is kind of underrated as well. Um, he's, I think, best known for being on, um, oh, what's that uh, show? Uh, Charmed, where he was there for, for a number of years as like the frequent bad guy. Nevertheless, I thought it was pretty great, and he was uh, playing Doctor Doom. So 2005. DC in 2005 did, however, have Constantine, Keanu Reeves' version. A little bit different, American, brunette, but still, I think, kept the, um, the, the ethos of the character, for the most part, pretty intact. Um, Tilda Swanton, as the, the bad guy, thought it was pretty good. Not the best thing I've ever seen, but not the worst. But this is also where, in 2005, Christian Bale begins, Batman begins, and, you know, Christian Bale, Michael Caine as Alfred, Liam Neeson as Raja Ghoul, uh, Katie Holmes as, uh, oh gosh, the love interest, um, what is her name, Rachel, Rachel something or other, um, anyway. Really good. Really good. And that was, I think, the highest grossing movie other than Titanic at one point. Tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Um, and then in 2006, I didn't love it. Uh, this was Brian Singer, who had much success with the X-Men franchise, trying to do Superman, of course, with uh, Brandon Roth as Superman, which he got to play later on as an older version in Crisis and Infinite Earths, by the way, and um, Kevin Spacey as Luthor, which I thought was also great casting, but I don't know. It just seemed as though this was dead on arrival. So I don't really recall watching it. Perfectly honest, like 2006, wasn't watching a lot of movies in 2006. Had a baby, another one on the way. It was, yeah, just wasn't watching a lot of movies. Uh, in 2006, over at Marvel, we had X-Men The Last Stand. So you know what I'm going to do? I think I'm going to put a pin in this right where it is. Because I usually stop around the 2000s with this kind of stuff. And I've gone a little bit past it. But um, sometimes the question is raised. When you have films that are rated minimally PG-13, and in some rare cases, and later than, than the movies we're talking about here, rated R. Who are these movies for? So I know when I was a kid, that 1978 Superman, I think it was rated PG, not G, but it was still, at least theoretically, for young people, for kids, superheroes, right? Because that's who the market was supposed to be. But admittedly, comics were also becoming darker at that time. So, of course, you could talk about the whole, you know, Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Um, who was that? Was that, um, was that Len Wein? Um, no. Let's see. Who was that? Um I think I'm getting them confused with someone else who's as soon as the name comes up, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah. Um, Because there was Green Lantern, Green Arrow. That series was super dark. And it was um, so Neil Adams. Oh, Denny O'Neill. Denny O'Neill. That's right. So Denny O'Neill was writing these kind of dark topical stories in the 80s. And that was part of the whole, okay, what is this audience? And the kids who were, you know, 10 years ago, or even like kids that were, you know, um, watching the Adam West stuff in the 60s were now older. And if you wanted to keep them, right, you wanted to make something a little bit darker. And that's what we keep doing with everything. Things that were once for kids, try to make more mature, 
because you want to keep those original, you know, readers. But honestly, if we just freaking grew up, we'd stop reading comic books and they wouldn't need to be appealing to adults, right? But if you're a uh, capitalist company, which they all are, you have to keep your uh, readership and expand it if you can. So if you're retaining the kids that were reading comics when they were four, five, six years old, well, the stories that they read when they were four, five, six years old are not going to be compelling to them in their, their you know, adolescence, into their teens, into their adulthood. Which is so unfortunate because you would hope that it would remain a, a art form that was for younger people. But I suppose that if you go all the way back into the very earliest stages of comic books, they weren't necessarily just for kids, I suppose. The original Batman comics were pretty dark and more like the the Pulp Fiction, things like The Shadow, for example, which also got a movie out of, um, oh my gosh, Alec Baldwin. He was an excellent Shadow. I mean, that guy's nuts, but The Shadow, his characterization was excellent. The movie was exceptionally weak. But if you ever want to read something amazing, what you want to do is you want to read the the Howard Shaken um, graphic novel, like the... Well, they made it a graphic novel. It was a limited series that they made into a graphic novel. But then the uh, monthly that came in afterwards, the earlier ones were written by Howard Shakin and artwork by uh, Bill Shinkevich, who didn't do a lot of monthlies. A beautiful painted art, like gorgeous, modern, almost abstract art. Amazing stuff. But anyway, again, it's like our generation and, you know, the those later boomers – Right. That whole uh, generation Jones, as they've come to be known, have definitely taken things that maybe should have been uh, youthful endeavors and either made them lifelong endeavors, made careers out of it. I mean, obviously, you know, comic book artists were once kids who were just doodling on the back of a notebook and became, you know, these fantastic illustrators. Same thing with these great movie directors. James Gunn at heart is a comics nerd and. You know, it's right there on his sleeve. But you would have to imagine that you could find some ways. There has to be a way in this cynical, crazy world that we live in to still have that innocence somehow come through. Why can't they be more earnest? Now, obviously, you know, you take the the Marvel Avengers series and you did have some earnestness with Captain America, for example. But of course, that had to be juxtaposed with that sarcasm and that snark coming from Tony Stark as Iron Man, right? So, so each character kind of had a, a, a niche in society, like a role that they played. But after watching the movie this weekend, with the exception of a couple of um, lewd kind of uh, some allusions to some unsavory things and of course the the you know over the top kind of violence of these movies it was you know what it is for all the the criticism that it's getting it had a lot of heart it had a lot of optimism it had joy and that i think is is too lost in the art form sometimes because they're trying to be so serious it's as though they think Oh, gosh, what was it? Avengers Endgame? Was that the one? Holy cow. Um, I want to make sure that I have this right with the the film. Let's see. Um, movies. Um, all right. You have film series. Why is it being very odd? Marvel Cinematic Universe. All right. What are the movies in the series? Of course, we have uh, The Avengers. Why don't they just do it all in like one? Uh, then it's uh, Age of Ultron, uh, Infinity War. The end of Infinity War. It was really emotional. 
like really, really emotional, you know? And I, I think, you know, the, the, the folks who are making these movies, in this case, Anthony Russo and Joe Russo, I mean, they're putting in performances that you're, it's like they're out there trying to win an Oscar. Now, I'm not saying that superhero movies shouldn't be worthy of, of Oscar contention if it's done well. But at the same time, that means that you're putting a certain amount of gravitas on something that maybe doesn't need to be so heavy. But then I go back, and the first time I really felt emotion at a comic book was uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, um, which... Um, I'm trying to remember what issue it was. Um, let's see. I'm going to look it up because I want to be certain. Um, sorry, as I'm typing this in and I really have to get better at talking and typing or someday actually have a producer. Um, number seven, issue number seven of Crisis on Infinite Earth. So that was a 12 part series and issue seven, the cover is Superman holding the dead body of Supergirl in his arms weeping. That was the first time I read a comic book and said, wow, wow, this is just too much, right? So I think, let's see. This was 1985. So I was 11 when that epi- uh, that issue came out. And it was like the most devastating thing because superheroes didn't die. But that's what I mean. It's like, I appreciated the fact that there was this emotional resonance, but at the same time, it was like, holy cow, does it need to be so heavy? I I mean, I guess it does. Everything evolves, but superhero movies, what do you think? Yay, nay, a lot of fun, too serious, too silly. Um, Did we have the better movies? Was that original, you know, Batman, Tim Burton, was that the best? Or was it, in my opinion, I, I say that the Christian Bale Christopher Nolan Batman movies were probably the best superhero movies that have ever been done, but also very scaled because it's not about a lot of uh, superpowers. Of course, it's all very rooted in reality, which I think makes it a compelling story. Well, what do you think? Love them? Hate them? What are the best? What are the worst? Let me know. How do you do that? You can email me at stuckinthemiddlepod at yahoo.com. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at StuckPodX. Head on over to the Facebook page, Stuck in the Middle, a Gen Gen X podcast. Please like, comment, share, leave five-star reviews, and most importantly, please subscribe to the podcast. So until next time, later, slackers.